Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And I want to start this morning by talking about the Florida uniform. <laughs> there is a Florida uniform here. Um, so it was brought to my attention that there are actually some people who um, are actually from here. That was new news to me recently. But for the most part, most are transplants. We come from other places up north. But we do so after vacationing here. And so when we come here, we wear the Florida uniform, right? So it is sandals. You can get away with that just about anywhere. Shorts. And then we figure it out. A polo shirt. Right? So that'll get you into pretty much any nice restaurant in Naples. So you're good to go. And basically, it's like a t-shirt with a collar on it. So it's not too much, right? So comfy. And that's the Florida uniform. Then you decide to move down. Why do we keep going back up north? We'll just stay here. If you're not, if you're not there yet, you will be. So <laughs> we just stay here all the time. And then what you do is you're tempted to do is just get rid of all the heavy clothes. You don't need them, right? Put them in a bin. They've been there for 10 years. And so we don't really need those up north clothes anymore. Like, this is the only time you will ever see me dress like this. That's it. So no hairy legs, you know, big ugly toes. You're welcome. So there you go. And that's why I do that. But otherwise, no, 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 no. I get the sandals, the polo shirt, at most, that's it. Right? And of course, the shorts. You don't want to go out without pants on. Well, that's a thing nowadays. We'll talk about that later. But anyway, anyway, so this is the uniform. This is what we decide to wear. But if you're smart, and it's just a tip if you haven't moved down here, you got to keep like one pair of dress shoes. Why? And maybe a suit jacket. Because people get married and people die. You're going to need to like wear them at one point or another. So I heard a story about a guy. He got invited to a wedding. He's new here, so he has the pair of shoes. The jacket, he was thinking, right? And so, tries it all on. Okay, it fits. We're good to go. Gets invited to the wedding. The wedding comes. He goes to the wedding, and then something happens to us guys sometimes at weddings. Now, you ladies, you think it's cute, and I'll explain to you why it's not. All right, so what happens is sometimes, if you make the mistake of getting on the dance floor unattended, a little girl will come up to you and ask you to dance with her. That happens. Or like, you know, somebody will send, oh, go dance, especially if you're a pastor. Uh, so, right, go dance with the pastor because that's cute. Right, so this happens to this guy. But here's what happens. The little girls, what they do is they feel the need to get on board. You know, so they just step right up on your shoes. <laughs> you're like, this is my only pair of shoes, right? So they get on, and here's what happens to this guy. The girl, his niece, is just like, let's just say it nicely, a little too old to be getting on board, right? So, but she does, and now you wear those shoes, I forgot what they're called, they're black patent leather with the thing, and with the white socks, right? And, but they have sharp heels that dig into your toes, right through the shoes. And so she's up on there, and yeah, we're dancing, right? DJ's playing slow song, and he's like, okay, I can just make it through this one slow song. I'll make it, right? But the women, right? They got the phones out, it's the real, it's the story, and they go, ah, right? And so the DJ, you know, he wants to appease the lady, so he's like, let's do another slow song. Ah, you know, the guy's like, ah, you know, this is terrible, this is really, but it just keeps going on, and slow song, and the guy just starts thinking, why MCA, chicken dance, I'll take anything at this point, just get this girl off of my shoes, right? So finally it ends, and the guy, you know, he makes it back to his seat, and looks down at his shoes, ruined. They're just tried, they're ruined. The only pair of nice shoes. So it's an early wedding, they get in the car, and you know, he takes his shoes off. And now, if you just thought, did he drive home barefoot? You're new here. Florida rule, you keep sandals in the trunk at all times. Why? Sand, all that. So anyway, so tip, you're welcome. So he puts his sandals on, shows his wife the shoes. Look, look what she did. Okay, well, take it to the repair shop. It's on the way home. They're probably still open. We'll drop them off, see if they can get those horrible scratches out. Okay, they drop the shoes off. A week later, the wife, hey, did you pick up your shoes from the repair shop? Uh, no, yeah, I'll get to it later. Not important because you don't wear shoes all the time down here. Okay, next week, hey, did you pick up your shoes? Uh, and so he's procrastinating horribly. And he doesn't really need them, so it's not an immediate problem. So the wife, the next week, she decides to stop. She's like, I'm going to let him run over a cliff or whatever. T 
Two years later, he gets invited to another wedding. Yay! So <clears throat> he goes for the suit jacket first, right? Tries it on. Wife, honey, does it still fit? No, two years later. You got to be careful, right? So he stay <laughs> he's not careful. So it doesn't fit. Let me take it to the tailor. We have a couple days before the wedding. I'll get it taken out a little bit. So she's going to go do that. He goes for the shoes. You know that feeling like when you lost your wallet or something like that? So it's one of those. You're like, oh, or your sunglasses, but they're right on top of your head. So it's like that. So he looks for the shoes. Now there. So what's the first thing us guys do? Honey, where'd you put my shoes? Right? So that's her fault instantly, right? So just learning, learning, learning. Don't do that. It's like, well, remember, you know, the, you dropped them off at the repairs I don't know, two years ago. No. No, 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 no. So here's the thing. She knows something. She's a good wife. She knows this. All right. If you want to know, guys, if you want to know, like, who the last people who got married last the last place you went to a wedding, the last person who died, you look in the inside pocket of that suit jacket. That's where all that information lives, right? You know, even maybe some almonds in like a net bag or something like that, a little thing of bubbles, some rice that you didn't kill birds with, right? And then like the card that's all about the last guy you knew that died, right? So that's all right there. She knows this. So she reaches in the pocket, repair ticket. Ah, uh, you see? <laughs> it was in your jacket pocket, his answer. Why'd you put that there, right? So he takes the ticket and he's like, by chance, maybe they'll still have the shoes. So long shot, right? He doesn't want to buy a new pair of shoes, only a couple days. So he goes and he's like super apologetic at first. And then he realizes, he's like, are you married? And the guy goes, yeah. He goes, see, you know, it was my wife. She dropped them off two years ago, procrastinated, procrastinated. You know, finally I got the wedding. You know how it is, right? Well, the guy working at the store is like surprisingly understanding. It's weird. He thought like, dude, two years? Really? You know, no, you don't get, this happens all the time. Yeah, I get procrastinating. I totally understand. So let me go look in the back. Guy goes in the back, rummaging around. Of course, they're probably underneath a lot of stuff. All this rummaging around. Finally, the guy comes out. He just has the repair ticket, though. And so now the guy's worried. He's like, oh, no. Did you get the shoes? Yeah. We have your shoes. Okay, that's great because the wedding's in a couple days. Uh, so can I have them? Um, they'll be done next Friday. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about procrastination. It seems to be a thing. It's a little late. Like that's called a hand grenade joke, right? Just poof, later. So <laughs> saw me on the way. Oh, <laughs> on the way home. That's really slow. That's not a hand grenade. I don't know what that is. But anyway. <laughs> procrastinating. That's going to be the theme today. I'm sure you're thrilled about it, right? So last week, we talked about rejection and acceptance. Today, we're going to see a theme of, well, procrastination, but immediately. So I made you guys a chart, and this is a doozy. Uh, this one took a while. The Bible, not in chronological order. If you've been here for a while, you know that. If you're new, welcome. Uh, the Bible is not in chronological order. You have to do kind of what I'm doing here to get it to go in like a smooth flow. And even then, not all scholars agree. It's kind of confusing. So I'm using a lot of resources and my brain, hopefully, to put these things together for you. Uh, but you're going to see a theme. Right away, disciples, they follow Jesus. How? Immediately. Jesus casts out an evil spirit immediately it comes out. Jesus heals many people. Immediate, immediate, immediate. Jesus' ministry uh, by the sea, you're going to see that people leave their businesses and everything immediately. Jesus heals a man with leprosy immediately. Paralyzed man immediately. Matthew leaves everything immediately. Right? So you're going to see that here. And then you're going to see something that might, might be holding some people back. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, if you don't know a lot, about how the Gospels work. I'll share a little with you so you understand why I'm doing this. Mark. The Gospel of Mark is the shortest of all the Gospel accounts, about 16 chapters, and it moves kind of quick. Uh, it's often called the Gospel of immediately. 
I'm not sure whether immediately shows up more than the other Gospels or not, but it's more condensed. It's kind of packed in there. So everything is moving along really, really quick through that Gospel account. It takes about two hours if you're going to read it. I suggest doing that. All right? So they're meant to be read, the Gospels, like we watch a movie, right? And so we don't watch, like I've said this before, a minute at a time. You know, we, we watch the whole thing. We sit down and we watch a movie. So we get how it all goes together, how the story worked. That's how the Gospels work. They're supposed to be read like all in one sitting. Don't worry, you won't be here for two hours. We're just doing that. All right, so, but what I'm going to do, it's going to seem like I'm moving kind of quick. And that's really intentional. I want you to see something. And I want you to feel something. We're going to get a theme here. We're going to hop into Luke a little bit. All right, so it crosses through. And you'll see we'll build on a theme today. So don't worry. It'll, it'll move quick, but I'll slow it down for you. So let's hop right in. Mark 1.16. One day, as Jesus was walking along on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, that's Peter, and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once, Greek, immediately, and followed him. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called to them, he called them at once, immediately, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Where'd you go? You know, so <laughs> they're just immediately leaving. We keep going. Mark 1.21, Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he immediately went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. And at that, so immediately this evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. We'll go back to the chart, and I'm going to overview some of these for you, just to give you the idea. Again, we're going to move quick, but I want you to feel this. So what happens is uh, Simon Peter, they go back to the house. Simon Peter's mother-in-law is sick. She has a fever. Immediately they approach Jesus about it. He touches her. She gets well. She's healed of the fever, ministers to them. Lots of crowds start coming to the house. Gets real busy. Then Jesus goes away to be alone in the morning to pray. It says like an isolated or deserted place. They can't find him. Peter and the gang go and find him. And he says, I want to go out to preach. This is the crux of what I came to do. So that is what happens in the next section. Moving pretty quick, we'll hop to Luke. So now we see that Jesus, and he does this a couple of different times, and it looks like kind of weird. Like, why would he get, he gets in a boat to teach. Well, in Mark, it tells us, we're going to get into that later, that the crowds were like going to crush him. Like that's what's going to happen to Jesus. He's getting crowded. And so he gets in the boat like to keep away from the people. Also, if you're looking, like sometimes we used to preach at the beach, it's kind of like a natural amphitheater. It kind of works that way. So it's kind of interesting. He'd be the focus of attention, and you can really throw your voice kind of far. That's what he's doing. So gets in a boat, starts teaching, and then has a dialogue with Peter. He decides to blow his mind. So he says, you know what, Peter? Throw the net over and catch some fish. Like, go out a little bit further, catch some fish. He's like, oh, we've been at this all night, whatever. Now we're not going to get anything. But because of your word, he says, what you told me to do, I will. Throws the net over, fills up immediately with fish. So many, hey, get another boat, and they're sinking. Peter's mind is blown. Like, get away from me. I'm a sinful man, Lord. Again, I'm going to make you Fishers of people. You'll be catching people, not just these fish. A physical demonstration of how many people they're going to bring to the Lord. And, important, they left everything and followed him. Everything. Uh, if we continue in Luke, Luke 5.12, in one of the villages, Jesus met a man with an advanced case of leprosy. When the man saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him. I'm willing, he said, be healed. And immediately the leprosy disappeared. And Mark, don't tell anyone. And then he goes and tells everyone. Luke 5.17, one day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in Galilee and Judea as well as from Jerusalem. 
And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Now, every homeowner's like, oh, what are you doing? That's expensive, right? It's a different kind of roof, like thatch roof. Not a big deal. And then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home. Praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and fear. We talked about that last week. It is fear in the Greek. And they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. If we keep going later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi, Matthew, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and left everything. And leaving everything behind, it says, <clears throat> and he followed him. So if we keep reading, just kind of summarize, a lot of you guys know this. Actually, they're at a banquet eating. Why do you eat with sinners and tax collectors? And you get that sick well, right? So, you know, those who are, who are well, they don't need a physician. Basically, those who think they're righteous, right? You know, I came for the sick, those who know they need me, who are sick. If we keep reading, Luke 5.33. Now, here's where we get the other side of this. One day, some people said to Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray regularly. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? Jesus responded, do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Then Jesus gave them this illustration. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and uses it to patch an old garment. For then the new garment would be ruined. And the new patch wouldn't even match the old garment. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the new wine would burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine must be stored into new wineskins. But no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. The old is just fine, they say. Old traditions. And so here is a link, and this is what's really cool about doing bigger sections of text. I want you to see something right now. So this is like kind of a link right here. So you have these old traditions. Another thing with Jesus, people are hanging on to the old wine, right? The old things they used to do, and they're not ready for the new him, his teaching, the kingdom. Right? So they're stuck on things, holding them back, holding them down. And the Sabbath is one of those things. And it's not that the Sabbath is a, is a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's God saving us from our prideful selves. That's what the Sabbath is. It's these extra nitpicky traditions, right? So they ruin it with all these different little rules that they come up with. And this is Jesus' problem. So made another chart. I squeezed in a whole bunch of extra stuff at the end. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview so you can see something, and then we'll get right to the application. So what you have now it's at the other end. There's the paralytic at the sheep gate, the pool of Bethesda. You might just remember that one. The man, he's sick for 38 years, right? So he can't get to the water to be healed. So Jesus says what? Pick up your mat and walk. Again, immediately. But there's a problem with it. Oh, you did it on the Sabbath. It's working on the Sabbath. Then you're going to see the disciples. They're walking through a field, right? And they're picking heads of grain to eat. Ah, that's working. On the Sabbath, you can't do that. And that's what Jesus famously says, right? The Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Then you get to Mark, and it's the man with the withered hand. Again, it's on the Sabbath. And what's interesting in Mark 2, that's what happens at the end of that. Right? And so if you don't have chapter numbers, you go, oh, there's a little theme here. Because again, another issue on the Sabbath at the top of chapter 3. His hand is withered, right? They wanted the religious leadership. They want to test him out, right? He's going to work on the Sabbath by healing. So Jesus gets upset with him, says famously, right? Is it permitted to do good or evil on the Sabbath? If you go to Matthew, it gives you a little insight. So you'd have to insert that there. And he gives an illustration. If one of you had a sheep and it fell into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work like basically by getting it out? And he turns to the man and he heals his hand. 
immediately. Put out your hand. Immediately, it's restored. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with the Sabbath. I encourage everyone. So this is the one of the Ten Commandments. I always say that people are prideful about breaking. You wouldn't break any of the other ones. Right? So it's the basis right, for the rest of the law. No, we're not under the law, but it's the basis. They're really good ideas. The Sabbath's a great thing. It's what they're doing with it. They're becoming very legalistic about it. And so this is Jesus' issue. So it's all framed inside of that. Like anything else with people, right? It becomes the old wine. It becomes something that's holding us back, something we're hooked on. We kind of start maybe even worshiping if we're being real. And here's the thing. If you're looking at all these accounts at once and seeing it, sometimes those old ways of doing things can cause us to become complacent. They can cause complacency, the old wine. But here, <laughs> we see this overlying theme, and you should feel a push-pull, right? Jesus is, everything's immediate, everything's immediate. And the healing's their response to this faith and to the immediacy, criticism of the complacency. Right? So this is what's going on here. The call to do things immediately. And so you'll see you later, right? Come follow me. Oh, you don't have to bury my dad, right? Let the dead bury the dead, right? Now, now, now. Jesus is never like, yeah, take your time, <laughs> right? No. And when people are faithful, what happens? They're healed immediately. Right? So everything's immediate with Jesus, and you should be seeing this, right? So we went over that. feels kind of quick. So here's the thing to us. What is urgent to us? How are we responding? What might be slowing us down in that call? This is often how it is with our faith. We kind of back burner the faith stuff or the spiritual stuff. Are there things in our lives that are slowing us down, the sense of urgency? can be a lot of things. We procrastinate a lot. But the Bible shows us something very, very different. We don't see the response to that call the way we see it here. Right? And if we do, it's not a good thing. The old wine is just fine, they say. Interesting. It's critiqued. Again, Matthew left everything behind immediately. And we see the appropriate response to Jesus' call. Immediate. But Jesus highlights the wrong response. The old wine is just fine, they say. We see that Jesus calls, and those who respond in faith, the blessing. But, some say, old wine is just fine. They're just satisfied with that to be complacent. So, this is the gospel, Jesus in the flesh. What does immediately, though, look like for us today? We are called to follow Jesus. But what does it look like? What does answering the call of Christ look like in today's context? In these accounts, people are picking up and leaving everything to follow a physical Jesus in human flesh. Right? Now, some say, well, he's not here. How does that look? How do, I, how do I do what Matthew did? And some will even use it as an excuse, right? Well, that was Jesus in the flesh. That, that's the apostles. Right? Okay. What does it look like to follow Jesus now? Now, Jesus' body is the church. Ephesians 1.22, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. After Jesus' ministry in a physical body, he's crucified, died, rises three days later, and then spends 40 days appearing to his followers. Then he ascends to heaven. 
then if we keep reading in Acts, the church is born, the body of Christ. So that is here. We're in like the church age, as some would say, until Jesus comes back and creates the new heavens and the new earth. We don't even need a sun, nothing. Way better than here. Right now, the church. So the church is born. And the church is identified in the word of God as the body of Christ. To follow Jesus now, to answer his call, is to be a part of the church. And it's funny, this, you, know, you get deep in things and then simple stuff doesn't occur to you sometimes. But it occurred to me, thank goodness, in time for the message today. The very <laughs> definition, the very definition of church in the Greek language is to be called. That's what it means. Right? Ekklesia. So the ek part, <laughs> from, and like that, Lysia, Klesia, <laughs> means called, from the called. So you can expand it in a biblical way of thinking about it. It gets translated, the best translation is probably the assembly, is what it is, right? So that's why some denominations we assemble, they're the assemblies, right? It's pretty good, although they get a lot of the other things wrong. But, <laughs> but anyway, the church, that's how we, we say it. But it's not a building. It's an assembly of called people. So if I was looking at that word in Greek and I really wanted to, it's like a compound word there. Ecclesia, you see a couple things. From the assembly of those who are called from the world to God. That's kind of the picture you get if you're looking at it the right way. From the called. Jesus calls. You're from that group, but then you assemble. You're a part of the body of Christ. You're then with him in that way. Yet, and, it, and as powerful as that is, and I hope you all understand that. I tried to bounce that off my wife too. I'm like, do we need a chart? She's like, no, we don't. <laughs> do you need to put the words up? No, we don't. You know, so I hope you understand that. Like basically, churches, the assembly, from the called. You've answered the call. When you come here, you're answering Jesus' call. That's what it means to be a part of the church. It's beautiful, it's deep, it's multidimensional, it's a really neat thing to think about. Yet, here's the crazy thing, there are so many today who identify as Christians who have deprioritized church. <laughs> the very way you answer the call to follow Jesus. We see there are many claiming to be Christians and they don't go. But we see here that the church is the body of Christ. And it's very, very funny because those who dismiss this, another thing to think about, you know, I was thinking about this context, it was kind of interesting. Hold on, <laughs> right? You have the birth of the church in Acts. Okay, then what are they doing? They're going around to these church groups, right? That's the mission. They're going around to all the cities and making churches, planting churches. Then from Romans to Revelation, the rest of the New Testament, the entire context is church. Romans, the church in Rome, Corinth, one or two, <laughs> the church in Corinth. I mean, just all the way through. Ephesus, the church in Ephesus. Right? Philippians, the men, the overseers and the deacons there. Where? The church. Colossae, the church. Then two people in the church, Thessaloniki, Thessalonica. Right? There, then to the leaders of the church, Timothy, Titus, like Philemon. It's just it's the whole context is church. So for the people <laughs> who are saying, I don't need church. I mean, a Christian without church. You basically have to take the majority of the New Testament and dismiss it. Dismiss it. That's it. It's crazy when you think about it that way. You know, I'm just going to read the Gospels, and that's where it stops. Like, Jesus doesn't ascend to heaven, none of that. What? It's critical. He proves he's God. He rises from the dead, ascends to heaven, and leaves us with his church. <laughs> it's important. It's referred to as the body of Christ for a reason. It's essential in this relationship. You need your church, and your church needs you. Now, I've said this before. I'll make it quick. To those who say, I don't need church, first, Again, it's not biblical Christianity. 
All these things, right? So they'll quote all these verses from the New Testament in the church. And say, it's happening in the church. <laughs> That's the point. It's all about the church. And so if it's not biblical Christianity, it's not Christianity. If it doesn't come from here, it isn't Christianity. That's important. Second, and I've said this before, say it quick. I don't need church. That's selfish. Maybe, okay, you're, you're great, I'm sure. <laughs> you got it all together. But maybe your church needs you. Now, here's the other thing, too. And I'm just not going to get into it, but I've run into people who've left this church. Not one of them is better for it. They're not doing okay. They're pretending like they are, but they're not okay. So for your sake and for the local church's sake, we're going to go against what society tells us to do. What? Imagine that. I'm not going to try that again. My voice could crack. So <laughs> we're going to do what Jesus tells us to do. So it's going to get interesting, but don't worry. I'll get, I'll get us back around. We're going to stop enabling people not to come. You're all good, right? So right now, I was quiet for a minute there, and it was a little scary, I know. You're good. If you're here, you're good, all right? So we're going to... You're welcome. We're going to stop enabling people not to come. See, it was to the camera, right? Or... <laughs> So here's the thing. Tech, let's talk about technology. <laughs> it was so cute this morning. I had <laughs> your sweet little daughter, <laughs> Abby, tell me, like, I'm going through the warm-up, you know, through my notes, checking the mic. <laughs> she says, the little girl, she says, you're doing great. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like, can you just bring her in from now? If she can be quiet, like, she's going to sit right there. She's like, <laughs> my mommy yells at me all the time. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, just uh, over the past few years, the world has changed, right? The world has changed. And it's both good and bad. We learn, right? We learn when we change. It's changed. And some is good. I'll talk about the good stuff, like technology. Technology has been like a big thing. And, really, and you had, even me, I had to like learn new things. And I'm really good with technology generally, but I had to learn new stuff. You know, like, what's Zoom? You know, I don't want to do that. But okay, there, there's, some, there's some good stuff in there, right? And so I leverage the technology. I put the number up on the screen. I text out a Proverbs Devo if you want it. I'll text it to you, you know, Monday through Friday every morning. And that's cool, right? So it's an open pastoral door. It's amazing how many people I can text in a short period of time, have a meaningful correspondence with, whereas in the old days doing that by phone, that would have taken me a week. <laughs> like, so one morning I get done, that's it. Like, it's a week worth of phone calls. Like, not everything's a phone call. And so, and to the old people here, just listen, you got to, you got to just bear with me. Young people work, right? And so when you call them, call them, call them, call them, they're working. <laughs> they can't pick up the phone, right? So a lot of the older people, they've learned how to text. That's a text. Like, just, just shoot me a text. And here's the thing, too. We need to talk. Don't do that. It's not very nice, right? So anyway, just a text. It's just a text. And sometimes we've been at meetings where you've been in that meeting and you're like, this could have been a phone call. Like, why are we here? So we've kind of learned how to do those things, and it's nice. It's efficient. I like it. It makes my job efficient, easy. I can reach more people. It's great. Okay. But the bad end, and you hear, if you watch the news, don't do that anymore. But anyway, you see them talking about, like, everybody's got to get back to work. And all these CEOs are like, come back to work, come back to work, come back to work. Why? Because there's just certain things you can't do virtually. It's not the same, like pastoring. Like, I can't read body language. There's some things, if the problem is bad enough, I need to meet with you personally. It's important because I can't, I can't gauge it. And then there's, oh, with the Holy Spirit, that, you know, so that's kind of important, right? But in a corporate sense, there's certain things you can't do, plus no accountability. People are going to work with no pants on, right? So that's a thing. And then they forget, and they turn around, and they're like, ah! So... <laughs> Right? So it's in, go to work, right? So get back to work. The, <laughs> the same thing is true of the church, not the pants part, but the accountability part. <laughs> and there are some things you just, it's not the same on the line, right? So it's not the same. And I'm going to demonstrate to you biblically how 50% of church cannot be done online. You're doing half church. So if you're not coming to a church, 
You're not physically coming. It doesn't have to be this one. If you're not physically coming to a Bible-believing church, it has to be a Bible-believing church. It must. But it, you, you're, you're doing half church. That's what you're doing. You're not you because you're here. But, you know, you're, do, you're doing half church. It's half church. 50%. There are some things that technology can't replace. Church is one of them. And sadly, there are many who have not come back. Once we did, we didn't always do streaming, and for the reasons I'm going to let you know. Even when it was available, I didn't do it. I was like, nope, 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 nope. That's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say, like, stream your church services. <laughs> so, no, but I said no, because I knew what it would lead to, and I'm going to tell you what it led to, what it did. These are some bad things. Some people never came back. They never came back. I don't need church. I'm good. <laughs> okay. You know, yes, you do, you know. So here's one of the things we're going to stop doing, which I believe is enabling. And so ready? We're going to stop streaming the services. <gasps> Can he do that? Yes. Did you go to church 30 years ago, right? <laughs> How'd it work out, right? It was okay, right? <laughs> Duh. You know, like anyway, think. We're going to stop doing that, right? So here's the thing, though. I want to say something. I did not just cancel online church, right? So Pastor Gene just canceled. Probably get us, like, a lot of views, right? But I did not just cancel online church. No. I want to say this. Listen. Listen. Because I'm going to get emails and texts. Listen. We are still going to be putting the messages online. Okay? So it means you got to wait a little bit. It goes on in the afternoon. I'll tell you. I'll give you some instructions. You'll be just fine. So the message will go online. Our social media ministry is really big. I always say that this is a live studio audience. If there's 100 people here right now, then I just passed our numbers. I boosted that up. There's 87. Right? So, <laughs> but anyway, if there's 100 people in the room right now, this will go out online to thousands of people. We have some really good social media and online ministries. It gets out all over the world, it's the most efficient missions you can think about doing. It's really cost effective. And we reach people all over the world. All over the world. It's amazing. And here's where technology is good because it transcribes it. So if you're in another country, you'll do like the transcription and sometimes it's wrong. We saw how that happened, right? So YouTube isn't always right. But generally it's pretty good. And I do that with some of the videos on Instagram and stuff. So there's shorts and there's long ones. It's efficient missions. We don't have to send everybody everywhere. So it's really good. And we are going to keep doing that. Very important. So everybody hear that? We're not stopping the filming of the messages. What we have realized, and it's been heavy on my heart, what I realized before we did the streaming was it would enable people not to come to church. That's why I didn't do it before. We were in a season where I asked, you know, we had Naples City Manager at that time, not the same one as now, Coming to the church, I just asked the governing bodies, like, you know, they were Christians too, what do we do, right? What do we do? I don't know. I don't know everything. Stream for just a little bit. Okay. And then we all came back. I was like, honor the authorities, right? So it scared me. We did it. And exact, and you know, I'm not, I told you so, but exactly what I thought would happen did. Exactly. The Lord's Day is when we should be gathering in person. And what has happened here is that my notes just shrunk and I can't find them. There we go. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> like they changed my... Uh, my daughter's like, Dad, you're getting old. Um, <laughs> some don't. We should be gathering in person and some, they're content to just watch it from their beds Sunday morning. And so here's some of the things that I'm going to stop enabling. And be really real with you guys. And this is what I was worried about. Partying. I'm not enabling that anymore. I'm not. And I know it's a thing. Because I haven't always been a Christian. I wasn't a Christian when I first came to church. And so we found a church that the service started at 11 o'clock. Why? I can nurse a hangover and get myself there by then. It's true. That's what we did. Not enabling that. And no, we're not moving the service time later. <laughs> it's a trap. Don't ask me that question. Right, so well, let's go to my office. No more. Right? Sunday's the Lord's Day. Get up, go to church, drink less. Right? Jesus made water and wine. Yeah. Two drinks. Stop. <laughs> go to bed. 
go to sleep, wake up for church in the morning. Don't be hungover and don't come drunk. Well, you can, if you come drunk, that happens all the time. If you come drunk, I love you anyway. It's okay. We'll, we'll get there, right? I get it. But that's not what real church, real people means. Laziness. I've had people tell me, I'm just lazy. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty, but that doesn't negate the sin. Laziness. Fears. Now, this is a real one because here's the other side of it. We're talking about fear, right? We have people, love you, I love you, but I'm done enabling that fear. Now, you talked about fear. Everybody has fear. It's what it does to you. And if it's stopping you from coming to church, no, no. Now, that symptom is a sin. Right? I'm not enabling that anymore. It's okay to be afraid. Everyone has fear. You're lying if you say you don't. Everyone has fear. We talked about that last week. But if it's keeping you from following Jesus' call, I'm done with it, and I'm not enabling it anymore. Nope, I reject that. Isolation. We are not supposed to be alone. We're not. We are not, especially as Christians. We cannot be the body of Christ alone. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's temporary, right? You're not John on the island of Patmos. It's not you. Right? You're called to be a part of the body of Christ. It's time for Christians to get up. Don't pick up your bed. That's too heavy. Get up. Right? It's like, it's like, don't joke on the heavy things, man. It ruins the moment. I'll start again. It's time for Christians. <laughs> get up and get to church. Now, immediately. Immediately. That's what it is to follow Jesus. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to quickly address some reasons why some people might think, hear what I said? Think they need the streaming services. Again, <laughs> you know, you must have forgot what happened 10 years ago. You didn't have it. Or, you know, like whatever. You did okay. We all did just fine without it. So these are reasons people think they need it. And some are some like reasons and some are excuses. First one, I'm going to make this really quick because I really hammered this one. It made some people feel bad. And i got to let you heal. we got to heal. Healing will take place. Work. Don't tell me you need the streaming service because of work. Don't. Do not. Right? Like, look what? What did Matthew leave? What did James John? Simon Peter, what did they leave? Right. The Bible does the rebuking for me. I'll move on. I travel. This is really funny. People travel so they think they need the stream. Travel around. It's not you. I'm not talking to you. But, but they think they need it. And so I travel around so i got to connect with the church. The only way I can connect with the church. Okay, hold on. Stop. Stop it. You're traveling. Get out of your hotel room and experience the culture around you. That's really cool. Go try a church. Somewhere else, especially if it's in another country. That's awesome. Don't watch the stream here. What are you doing wasting your time in the hotel room? Catch up on my message later, right? No, get out. And then here's the other one. But there's no church in the area. Then go tell people about Jesus. It's kind of what you're supposed to do as a Christian. That. <laughs> Boy, I'm physically unable to get there. Okay. This is legit, and so I'm going to show you why I'm not being a meanie here. This is why. Okay, so here's one thing, and I don't want you to go this way, but I'll just say this, right? If you're just going to be stuck, you know, you're going to say, it's only the worship part that you're really missing. Right? That's all it is. It's the message, worship. That's it. First of all, we're not the only ones singing these songs. <laughs> you just look up the songs on YouTube. Oh, there you go. We have a worship playlist in the app. But... That's not my point. Don't take that and go, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Wrong. That would be the wrong takeaway. But I'm just taking another excuse. That's what I do. Take excuses away from you. You hate it. But here's the thing. Here's the ideal thing. And this is so funny. Like when I started looking at this, I'm like, this is where it went like this. It went like this real quick. So first thing, if you are home and you cannot get here, and I know every one of you, if you're because you're sick or whatever and we talk, I will send a member of the worship team to you, and you can sing together. You think that's funny? Check this out. When I was a pit that is a pastor in training, I was on the worship team. That's where I started. They dragged me out. I was drunk. I mean, it wasn't the first time I played hungover, right? So, because I was in bands when I was younger. So, whatever, I got used to it, then stopped doing that eventually. Uh, and then, like, 
got called to become a pastor. So did that, and I went through a long period of training. As a part of that training, I had to do visitations. These are people who are homebound. They cannot come in. It was a lot more people. This was an older uh, congregation for the most part. What did I do? I brought my guitar with me. <laughs> I'm a pastor in training, and I can sing. So we sung hymns. It was beautiful. It was some of the most beautiful worship. No offense to people who like, you know, a lot of stuff. We minimize it because you all get addicted to it. You get to worship the worship, and it's bad. Or <laughs> the worship leaders. So we minimize it. The most beautiful worship that I've ever experienced was just with one other person. And sometimes in a moment of just, they're going to die, <laughs> you know? Beautiful, heartfelt, where they meant it. They meant it. Beautiful. Right? Here's another thing. And I'm sure some crazy church is going to start doing this. They probably already are. I just ignore. I don't watch anything. So, but virtual communion. Did they do that? I don't know. I don't want to know. Don't tell me. It'd make me mad. But anyway, like the Lord's Supper virtually. You can't do that. You can't do that. I will put my foot down there. But that's the other thing I had in my hand when I went and did the visitations. My guitar and my communion kit. And we go do exactly what Jesus and the apostles did. We have the Lord's Supper and we sing a hymn. It was beautiful. That's so much better than the live stream. And here's where it gets turned around. It's made ministers lazy. Back in the day. Hey, so-and-so's sick. Okay, got to get a visitor. What do we do now? Or him? What do we do now? Oh, they can watch the live stream. That's what we do now. Oh, they got the live stream. They're set, right? Wrong. Wrong. This is where the ministers are wrong. There's another one. I just want to dismiss this because, real quick. I love C3 Church. There's nothing like it around me. Okay. I know we are experiencing a famine of the word of the Lord, like Amos say. That is true. That is true. There's not enough scriptures in the preaching. It's too much about me stuff. I get it. But again, you can watch the messages online. So this is for those who live far away, snowbirds, that's a thing. I get it. But here's the thing. Wait for the upload of the sermon and go visit some real humans near you. Right? Get out of the house. Do corporate worship as a body of Christ. Again, we're not the only ones singing these songs. There is no virtual replacement for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit when we come together and are united as the ecclesia. There's no replacement for that. You cannot properly do worship, church worship alone. You can worship alone, but it isn't church. It isn't church. It's not the same. It's literally the definition of church coming together. Online isolated church is an oxymoron. Here's the other thing, real quick, and I got to say it, because a lot of people won't think about this, but this is true. So the <clears throat> same people, some of the same people who are watching online, they're satisfied just to watch it online. That's it. They're like, oh, isn't it a shame that the churches are closing? Isn't it a shame? Yeah, it is. You know why they're closing? Because you're not supporting it. Financially or physically, you're not supporting it. And it's such a shame that the church is closing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I agree. It's a shame. You got to support your local church. You have to support your local church. Those of you, you know, I don't need to preach to you on this, but if you're new, just please just even if you made lunch, I get it, it's Naples. I make lunch plans too. You know, go upstairs and see our cafe. Don't, don't miss it. We're having recovery meetings there. It's awesome. It's like a community center. It supports people. It's a place we get together. We have our fellowship. It's wonderful. And here, big screen, right? That's why we have community movie days where people can come in. Maybe they can't afford. It's expensive. You want to take five, four kids to the movies? Oh, my gosh. Right? So we have a popcorn machine. It's just like the movie theater. They get popcorn. They watch a family movie. No bait and switch. We love you. <laughs> it's a church. They know. We love you. Come back. Don't you think that's a good thing to have in the community? Shouldn't we have more of these? Right? 
but they close. Why? And I can paint a picture because it's probably, actually, I know it's happening. Somewhere very close to this building, within walking distance practically, there's someone watching another church, a huge mega church, somewhere else online. Why? Because they went streaming with us, right? And then the suggested video that comes up under ours when they're done is some big church. And what? It looks a little better. It's flashier. And they're telling you what you want to hear. But that person down is not supporting their local church. And so local churches close. That's what's happening. No, we're good. Don't worry. Keep supporting. <laughs> we're okay. All right. But this is true. You need to support. And to those, I get it, you know, just be careful what you watch online. I mean, if it's popular, like fast food, is it good? Probably not. Be careful, but you need to support your local church. Jesus says what? Love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? That's your neighbor. You're not loving your neighbor. You're not loving your neighborhood church if you're doing that. Support your local church. And that goes for back home when you go back home. Support that church. Don't watch me online. Support your church. If you want to catch up on the message later, great. Following Jesus today begins with being a part of the church. So when we want to know what following Jesus looks like outside of the Gospels, we need to turn to Acts. And here's the scripture I'm going to give you, and I'll explain it, and we'll come to a close. Acts 2, 42. All the believers, as Jesus ascends to heaven, the Holy Spirit comes in power. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, sharing meals, and to prayer. Those are the points on the auditorium wall, just outside the auditorium. That's what that is. How does that contextualize today? Apostles teach. No apostles. I'm not an apostle. Don't call me that. Right? The word, the teaching of the word, everything begins there. Everything, that's it. It's everything. If we do nothing else, that, it's important. Fellowship, being together, that's what they did. Those are the instructions <laughs> we're supposed to do too. We really can't get that online the right way. Sharing meals, and this includes the Lord's Supper, cannot do that online, and prayer. 50% of church cannot be done online. You're doing half church if that's all you're doing. So following Jesus this way means making him a priority. It means dropping some of the things that may be holding us back from coming in. It means making this a priority. That's what being a follower of Jesus begins with. It's not the totality. No. But it begins there. Answering the call. So you can continue it as well through the church. Just some opportunities. I think Ed will tell you about some more just really quickly. I mentioned the text thing. I will text you every morning if you want me to. A little Proverbs Devo and it's my door virtually opening. We can talk, but then that can lead to a phone call or a meeting if you really want one. The fellowship. Go make a friend. <laughs> Go upstairs and make a friend. And that's our small group. Ooh. Do we have small groups? Yes, but they're not program guided. They're Holy Spirit guided. And so that's what happens. You get together, the Holy Spirit nudges you, you go talk to someone, hey, you make a friend, and then maybe you go have coffee or lunch during the week. That's your small group. Anything bigger, you're going to get lost. Two, two or more are gathered. There you go, just the two of you. Make a friend. Get real. That's church. You keep doing church throughout the week. Buddy up. We continue to use these tools of the church to continue in that faithful following of Jesus. These help us maintain that resolve to the resolution. We work together, supporting one another. One of us kind of gets bogged down. Come on. We need each other, the church. Jesus is calling us into that resolution immediately. And when we answer that call, he brings us into relationship indefinitely. I want to close with scripture. Hebrews 10, 23. 
Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of Jesus' return is drawing near. As we work together, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Thank you.